or ni marlinga poyo go tuka just finish lojos family lojos brother wandi go alan and should be wearing a marlinga we have a legacy of real trouble in this country because of those british atomic tests It's our thing, it's our stuff. Although we never call it uranium, we don't know what uranium word is. We got our own name for that. Australia is the only society we understand to have ever provided its own uranium to an overseas nuclear weapons state to make into weapons to then bomb back on our own land. When an atomic bomb explodes, it creates radioactive particles, some of which are heavier than others. The heavier ones fall first. The very light ones might travel around the world several times before they fall to the ground. But they will do one thing, they all fall to the ground. My first introduction to atomic warfare was uh, being told to turn our back on the island and uh, we heard this almighty explosion and uh, roar and then we turned around to look at the island to watch a large mushroom cloud slowly going up into millions of miles up into the sky. I was 19 at the time. I thought it was marvellous to be a witness to such a thing. over the sky, sort of, it looked like a very fine cloud, but it didn't go away, it was there for about four or five days, or could have been more. And it was light, that the, the sun sort of filtered through it as well, but it was there. The aircraft that I was in took off at about 11 o'clock at night, and we flew a triangular pattern northwest out over the Indian Ocean, then south towards the Montebello Islands themselves, and then northeast again into Broome. We spent nearly nine hours on that trip. Because it was night time, we saw no evidence of any cloud. The evidence of the cloud was in the filters that were fixed underneath the wings of the aircraft. We're all bush hunters, fishers. That is our culture, That's we look forward to doing that. Take our young children out fishing and hunting. You go back before all these bombs and that were let off. Aboriginal people lived years, you know. cloud from the Operation Hurricane Bomb did in fact traverse the country because three days later aircraft operating out of Townsville picked up the radioactive particles from the explosion. Two days later again Royal New Zealand Air Force aircraft picked up radioactive particles out over the Pacific north of Newcastle that had emanated from the same bomb. We patrolled the island quite regularly for a year and then in October 1953 I went back to the islands again with a group of British scientists and we worked on the island for two weeks while they collected data up there and I worked on the island with them. 
the thing I've always said is uh, they were wearing specially designed suits and gloves and boots and hoods and I walked around in a pair of shorts and a t-shirt. Famous British atom scientist Sir William Penny at a press conference on his arrival in Australia is emphatic that there will be no dangerous radiation from forthcoming tests at Maralinga. Stressing the importance of the tests, he says... Any weapon has to be tested. It doesn't matter whether it's a shell or a bullet or whether it's a, a carrier of a weapon like an aeroplane. It must be tested. We weren't told that we should perhaps have more showers than usual. Uh, we weren't told that we should refrain from conceiving children for some considerable time, at least 12 months. In actual fact, we were told nothing about what might ensue from having been inside the cloud. Now, the Monty Bellows have never been clean. They, they removed obvious debris, but they've never ever been cleaned. The government has maintained that there was no hazard to anybody connected with the tests. It's a lie, because on the Montebello Islands, to this very day, on Tremuya Island, which was the island where the bombs were set off, there are signs that say radiation hazard area. Do not stay more than one hour. Do not raise the dust. Do not take anything off the island. Do not eat here. You can't have it both ways, but the government wants to. As the years went by, my husband first of all got sick and oh, there's a lot of the other people before us and all died of cancer, some sort of cancer. Then my husband in 1962, he went down with cancer and then um, 63, it was my sort of my turn. <laughs> the period that when my husband died, there was about 12 people that died, all Aboriginal people all our age group, from Derby and Broome. It's not until years later when the, we started to have health problems, which is mine started late uh, 50s, early in the 60s, when I started to have to have large cancerous growths removed from my body, that I started to worry about it. So there was a, an understanding in those periods from the 50s through to the 70s that aerial, atomic, aerial nuclear weapons tests were having such a demonstrable um, effect that you could find the, the isotopes from those in children's teeth and in bone. People better understand there is no safe level of exposure to ionising radiation, and while the, the legal system may set the bar at a certain rate of exposure, that's not a that may be illegal, but it's not a safe exposure. Most of the country was covered by these radioactive particles, especially uh, from. Operation Totem, which took place 12 months later in a place called Emu in the Maralinga area. Dad was a young, young boy growing up through the area, um, learning the old traditional ways. You know, he did a bit of hunting, he did a bit of gathering, and, you know, he lived that old traditional life where he walked around, walked with his old people also. So that experience 
was something that he treasures. This is a main place, Waladina, important place. Ngurari uh, for this place. This is back in creation days to our Yinjiri people, community, living here. This is Nindaga uh, Wabar. We can tell stories about uh, the Nindaga. The Nindaga, the pranti over Western Australia border. He was inside the WA and he heard the noise. Because they were pretty powerful people and in um, creation days. He heard the noise and come all the way to here, to Waladina. But he wasn't in a hurry. He'd take time, he'd creating food, language, um, languages, different ones, and uh, he create a uh, Edma. Mount Woodruff is, uh, that's in, that's in Indaga, Pranti. It's just standing up like this, and he was looking out to his rock. But it's the uh, highest mountain in South Australia, I think. Yeah, Mount Woodruff. But uh, it's in Indak. My father, getting jobs, we moved different stations. And we move away for a while, and then come back here in 50s, 1950s, and um, to Waladina. Maralinga happens south of where Wallatina is, and that's very close to the heart for us, as in the Lester family or, you know, Yami's people. This place, um, it's still important, but uh, not as important now because on the 15th of October 1953 they uh, let the bomb off at 7 o'clock that morning a cloud come across from uh, south from Emu uh, right across here it was black, uh, smoke, shiny, oily looking thing rolling through. Expert reckon that's 60, 70 mile across the smoke went. They um, create something in return, payback, and they create a cloud. Nobody in a return, a payback, finishing. The black mist, um, they think it was created because they were trying to make a, uh, a, a cheaper weapons grade uh, plutonium. There's 20 times as much uranium in a bomb as there is plutonium. It all gets vaporised, uh, oxidised, and comes out as a, an aerosol. This black mist rolled through the tops of the trees and along the ground and through the grasses. The information, of course, wasn't passed on to the traditional owners or to the Aboriginal people who were in the area. It was something that they had no knowledge of or, or didn't know how to handle. People started becoming really sick soon after the fallout and that was a lot of family, a lot of Dad's family, a lot of the older generation, our great-grandmothers, our great-grandfathers and the old people who were there at the time. It 
was a hard time for Dad and it's it's not a, an easy thing for him to talk about, as same as his older generation also, our grandmothers and grandfathers. It's, a, it's something that they often say it should finish from Murray Linga, um, this continuing of uranium and playing around with you know, dangerous things is something that puts a lot of fear into the old people but also into me being the next generation. So it's, it's a scary thing. <laughs> Later bonds did the same thing. The government's own book, A History of British Atomic Tests in Australia, admits that in some of the fallout in New South Wales, hotspots were created at Lismore and Dubbo. Now, hotspots are where excessive radioactive particle fallout is experienced, which meant, of course, that if you were up in that part of the world, you were in very great danger by inhaling or ingesting these particles of getting cancer. So we got there January of uh, 1956. It took us about 12 or 14 days to travel by convoy to Maralinga. We booked the tents that we lived in. The Army was in front, the Air Force behind us, the Navy behind that. We worked out in the forward area from daylight till dark, uh, 12 hours, sometimes 13 hours a day, uh, seven days a week. We went around all the time in shorts and boots. And there were certain areas you couldn't go to. You had to go through and get dressed up and this white outfit and go forward you know, and do the job and come back and you get showered and they'd take the radiation reading. But the pass where we were working in, doing the fencing, was all uh, no more than 150 yards away from an atomic bomb, which had went off four, four months earlier. And he said, we've got to go out there today and we'll give the scientists a hand to measure the, the radiation. And there was a steel road out to Tamaku, and we went out there and there'd been a ground burst and left a 80, 90 metre crater there by about 100 metres long. It had rained in 56 and it poured and the crater was all glass. The, the, the bomb just makes the, the, the can turn to glass. Waterproof. Uh, there was a health physics caravan there. One side was dirty, the other side was clean. You got, you got in, took off your clothes, put the white overalls on, white top on, white things over your boots and so on. And I was first to get to go through and I looked out and uh, I see this Aboriginal fella. And I thought to myself, I thought, we, we used to have a few drinks for night time. I thought, no, me, this, what am I seeing here? Here's a fella coming on the dark side, the, 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 the dirty side. And he's got two or three spears. He's got these pelts hanging over his arms and the billy can. And I said to Mark, uh, there's an Aboriginal fellow outside with pelts and, and spears. And he went, white, a pure white. I said, where I said, out there. Oh my God, he said. Anyway, he drove away. So next thing you know, he brought back four. He brought back this Charlie and old party, we now know him, his wife, Edie, uh, and a boy and a girl. Charlie was telling them and that they'd used the water and it didn't taste any good. The reason why he was here seeing us was to try and find some nice water, fresh water. But by the same token, the British have put millions of pounds into this, uh, into this scheme and uh, we don't want anyone outside knowing about this. Everyone here has signed the Secrets Act and that in itself gives you 30 years jail for the firing squad if you break it. And so that's how they got away with it. And then there was nothing in place, and then there was, otherwise it was just rotten sand. They decided to use plutonium and they, they poured petrol on it and blew it up, burned it, and they blew it up with uh, TNT and everything. 
And that's why melding is the way it is now. All these weapons were tactical weapons such as might be used on the battlefield. This is viewed at 10 miles, but as you see, it's very difficult to judge distances. There is very little wind on this particular day. The cloud hung there and appeared, if anything, to be coming towards us. Twenty minutes later, the cloud has spread right out. Notice the fallout that appears to be coming down like rain. It hung there in front of it. I was posted to Maralinga test site as a lieutenant. I was the 2IC of the Antler Engineer Troop. Uh, we were located 10 miles from the test site area. I was there for six months for three tests named uh, Taji, Biak and Taranaki. Immediately after the first test, we were asked to report to um, the range facilities. Thirty minutes later, we found ourselves 50 yards from the test site, testing how much radiation they needed for a radiation implosion bomb, which would be later a hydrogen bomb. The area was gone. We were close enough to see the um, remains of the tower on which the bomb had been detonated and you could see the shape of the fireball uh, burnt into the steel legs at the bottom of uh, the aluminium tower. Um, we remained there for about 30 minutes because we had to gather information that would deteriorate if it was left there any longer. The fission products die down very quickly. It's the um, Alpha producing ones um, that take a long time to decay, they're in the thousands of years half-life. Uh, not very dangerous when they're outside the body, but once they're in the body they uh, usually go to places like the blood bone marrow and interfere with your uh, autoimmune system. And that's where you get all sorts of funny things other than cancer from them. And one of the striking things, of course, is the, uh, the records that are missing. The two engineer troops at uh, Buffalo and Antler, uh, or we know they all had their radiation doses recorded, but there's no record of them in the official records anymore, so they must have been removed. There are hospital records missing. The Maralinga hospital records have disappeared and nobody wants to say where they are. The only person who's got any record of being in Maralinga hospital is me. The only piece of the person is And the only reason why I got it was to stop paying me. To stop them from paying me. But anyone else that tried to get records after when the Royal Commission was on couldn't. They were never, no such things. They were gone. Nobody knows. That was 1978. My records turned up. Any chance of winning a case we lost when they when we lost the, the, the Maralinga files. The Maralinga files went missing in 1978 and have never been seen since. Somebody must know where they are. John Howard was in Parliament. He was the treasurer at the time. Malcolm Fraser, I wrote to Malcolm Fraser, he was the Prime Minister when they disappeared. Somebody must know where, why 12,000, or as it turns out, 15,000 files on sick people, or people who were going to be sick, disappeared off the face of the earth. The government insists that there was no hazard. And indeed, 50 years later, I have a letter from the present Prime Minister, Mr John Howard, who claims that there was no hazard to either the servicemen concerned or to the people of this country. Now, I'm very sorry, but you don't have to be an intellectual genius to work out that if 
the aircrew men at Operation Totem in 1953 had their aircrew clothing taken from them. They had their boots taken from them. Navigation gear was taken from them and buried in a grave on the Woomera airfield. But if they later on cut up four of the Lincoln bomber aircraft because they were so badly contaminated that they could not be cleaned, then there must have been something wrong. 53 onwards, they used beryllium. Well, they said it was harmless, I mean, the Royal Commission, but now that it would appear now, but it's very far from being, it's very, very deadly. When you're talking about plutonium, you're talking about a half-life of 24,000 years. In other words, in 24,000 years, it'll be half as dangerous as what it is now. This stuff won't be. If it's dangerous then, it'll be dangerous in 5,000, 10,000 years' time. You can't get rid of it. We felt later that we were like lambs on the altar of British science. During the testing at Maralinga, the clouds of radioactive dust sucked up by the explosions were carefully tracked until they drifted out to sea. The clouds from successive explosions passed over much of the continent to the north, the east and the southeast of Maralinga. The government of the day, the Menzies government, and all governments since that time have denied that there was any danger or any hazard either to servicemen or to the people of this country. Now, of course, their denial was part of policy. They had to say that. But what we have since found out, of course, is that there was indeed a very great danger to the servicemen concerned who were given no proper protection and to the people of this country generally because of radioactive fallout. Could you imagine if the British government had tried what they did at Maralinga in remote counties of Scotland or Wales? You know, it would be the end of civilization. What happened was shameful. Uh, it would not, I mean, it would, could not have occurred elsewhere. Essentially, Aboriginal people were denied uh, their rights with devastating consequences. They blew the place up until there was no more room to blow up and then said bye bye, we're going. The, the, the nice old black fellas, they love it out there, that's their territory. It's not white fellas territory, it's, not, it's, it's, it's just strictly for the Aboriginal family. People who live in, who've learned to live over 40,000 years. <laughs> Colony <laughs> I don't know how it's going to balance with, the, with our country and with our spirits and with our creations. And, and nobody can touch a country, I guess, and destroy a country and walk away and, and get away with it. It's a big concern for me. Not only me, but other people. We talk about it all the time. What was acceptable in the 50s and 60s is not acceptable now, and what's acceptable now might not be uh, acceptable 10,000 years from now. At the end of 1989, I became Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and I went to Britain to argue the case for 
compensation and clean up of the Maralinga lands because what was left behind was americium, strontium 90, um, uranium, plutonium, dispersed plutonium all over the place. I have real doubts about the, uh, the success of the clean up. All they did was put you know, piled dirt all over, all over the radioactive material. Number one, Palangro wearing on Palagore, Tripon Devon, Urania, everywhere. Poison, only Marlinga, Poyo Wetuka, just finished. Lodge's family, Lodge's brother, Alan, and should be wearing on Marlinga. We, the next generation, have got a bit of a, a responsibility because some of us understand more of, you know, our cultural side, but also the Western side of things, which is something Nana can't quite grasp because she's an old tribal woman. They stole that land from Kuku the Mob. And the Australian government's done rocket testing. They've had Narunga there. We've had nuclear bombs on Cougar the land. And now they want to put a nuclear waste dump in as if we haven't had enough. Part of the legacy of the, the nuclear tests is not just the environmental contamination and the burial of plutonium in a shallow grave out at Maralinga. The British provided Australia with a reactor at Lucas Heights in Sydney, and we then joined the Reactor Club of the World. But it's waste from that reactor that's now intended to be dumped in North South Australia, the first national nuclear waste dump. But even the reactor itself is intended to be decommissioned, dismantled and trucked across unwilling communities right across Australia. We've passed legislation as a parliament opposing um, a nuclear waste dump in South Australia. Uh, this is the first time in the last uh, quarter of a century that a federal government has moved to compulsorily acquire state crown land against the wishes of the state. All of the international experts would say that if you've got radioactive waste or reactor waste, the repository should be as close as possible to the point of production. Now, what they're aiming to do is exactly the reverse of what anyone serious in international safeguards protocols would say. They're moving it thousands of miles away. So we, it's about the issue of transportation. We do not want radioactive waste from Lucas Heights nuclear reactor coming across our border, coming through communities, coming along our roads. It's preferable in our view that radioactive waste should be managed above ground in dry, secure, monitorable storage where one can intervene to apply developments of technology but to protect the environment and protect human health and burying it out of sight, out of mind, whether it's in, um, in a shallow national grave at the National Nuclear Waste Dump or when it's in an old mine, doesn't fit those, any of those proper standards. I guess we can speak more strongly on Murray Linga and the concerns we have for Murray Linga than the dump, but it is, it is very closely connected because it is something that Nana's taking on also, the, the campaign against the, the waste dump as well, which of course is a, is a big concern for Anangos because of the connection Anangos or Aboriginal people have with land and, and its waters. Those stories and where this actual site's going to be is along a storyline. Kukuta country, um, it's important in, in uh, Kukuta ceremony or in uh, religious life. Uh, the whole the whole landscape is a cultural one. That is, it was set down um, during the dreaming, and um, what's left behind is is evidence that our ancestral beings created the landscape. We hold the law for this area uh, and the stories and the songs. Follow the creek along, this is our main highway and there's no, it's no coincidence that this is our highway. It's been here for hundreds of thousands of years. Down the road here we've got a living area, we've got good timber, sand, that's where people camp. One of the things that's been evident 
to Indigenous people in this area is that we don't believe what the government says at all. Their past record is not a good one. What they've done to us at Maralinga, they continue doing that at Roxby, and now they want to force this nuclear waste dump down our throats. We don't want it. We've told them time and time again. We don't want it. The pastoral ministry doesn't want it. The people in South Australia don't want it. It's time they listen to people. We don't want uh, no more oh, no uh, more. radiation killing on their bomb and things. Yeah. And uh, they bury, they taking the uh, uranium dumps. They burying in a in a, in a yard all the way. Yard. Where, nah, where they 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 make them over that way yeah. in Sydney. They should bury them in their own yard. That's yard. what I say. That's what we say. What are we? It's not just a technology issue, it's not just an environment issue. It's a threat to the community's right to decide their own future. They are willing to corrupt a lot of values in, in society by imposing reactor risk and, and waste production. They refuse to accept the, the long-term legacy of either health impacts or of, of risks from the nuclear waste that result from that reactor production. First they destroy a sacred place to take this stuff. Then now they're going to have to destroy another sacred place or pollute this poison, this another place, sacred place to put this stuff back in. I don't know what we're going to do. It's more deadly now that which they've used it. It's called into a waste sort of. A, they call it waste now. <laughs> An example of how little Australia has learnt over the last 50 years from the Maralinga experience is that today a mine operates at Beverly, where General Atomics, the multi-billion dollar US nuclear corporation, operates an acid in situ leach uranium mine. Now, acid in situ leach is a method that's never been approved in any other OECD country, and the company there, General Atomics, rely on discharging all their radioactive mine waste directly to groundwater. They dump their mine waste, their radioactive legacy, directly into groundwater without any rehabilitation and under our legal system without any liability. They actually have exemptions from the Environment Protection Act in South Australia, a key matter for the SA government to answer over, where the management of, of uranium waste is exempt from the Environment Protection Act. South Australian uranium used in nuclear reactors produces plutonium. Half of the world's plutonium has been produced in civilian power reactors. So SA is complicit essentially in the, both the reactor risk and the waste production but also in the accumulation of plutonium around the world. They find a use, any use, for some of their material, try and contend to the public that their industry is, is demonstrated to be um, harmless. The conventional disposable smoke detectors contain americium, which is a, again a byproduct of the nuclear industry. If the smoke detector itself was to be burnt and, and powdered and inhaled, there is a health risk there. It's as much that that whole cycle of, of producing and dispersing radioactive materials is, doesn't make sense. When smoke detectors that don't use radioactive materials uh, can be just as or even more effective. Why are the same mistakes and the same bad practices being allowed to continue? Roxby Downs. That's one of the biggest uranium mines in the world. We know about that place. We knew about that place before the white man ever came here, or Captain Cook was even thought of or born. So we, uh, you know, we're saying that uranium is sacred. It's part of that, that land. It's part of the dream time. Big. Uh, concern about that place because that dream in there, it belongs to us too, it belongs to all the people. We suffer there because of the amount of water that they take from that, uh, from the Lake Air Basin. They just pumping something like more than 50 million litres per day. Now this is good, clean, sacred water. There must be roughly 50 million litres coming out in the tailings dam. And that's a lot of water per day. That affects all the mounds, all the mound springs, the soaks, what we had. 
we can't find water in those places anymore. They've been doing that now for some years, so there must be a hell of a lot of poison water there. Kunga Tudor, uh, Senior Aboriginal Women in North South Australia, they see it as the imposition of poison ground on their, uh, on their traditional lands and they're fighting for their culture, for their country, for the viability of, of what they see in the, as positive in their society. And it's really for all Australians to be mature enough to back our own traditional owners in that fight. <laughs> Australia with some of the best sunshine in the world, it's very hard to get a research grant to develop solar energy, but our government claimed that they have freely to have $500 million or so to put an unnecessary hazardous reactor in Sydney. They really do have the wrong set of answers to the current set of problems. There are alternatives to the production of medical isotopes through cyclotrons or through importing, which is the standard method for the key isotope technique in 99. Our government claims that we have to have a reactor in Sydney to have proper availability of this key medical isotope, and simply not true. Nuclear weapons programs have often started in so-called civilian um, nuclear programs. It, it really is not a great deal of difference between the two arms of the, of the industry, the civilian and the military. The proliferation of nuclear weapons is one thing, but actually it's the proliferation of nuclear technology and materials that is putting so many more countries at risk. Wasn't Chernobyl evidence enough of, of the, the issues and the damage? We share the tears and the acceptance that our lives as individuals can be so overwhelmingly affected and you don't even have to be there under a nuclear bomb but it's pretty awful when you are under a nuclear bomb they bombed my mother and she then passed on genetic DNA defects to myself so I have not been able to have children, but I have three uh, ovaries, and I'm just one of, of many women in my community who've been affected in, in terms of reproduction issues. Traditionally, culturally, we wouldn't have talked about it, but this is stuff that you just can't not talk about. Wanga Niki Adi Yaninda Wanga Niki Ori Alai Uragana Wadu Mutu Kari Okapunda Bunda Baka Baka and Oka Maja Kari Oka Morka and Oka Anandaras Nurtu Maja Kari Morka and Anandara. What I'm saying is I'm talking my language. I'm talking old, this old language from Dreamtime. It's like the old country too. It's old. And these people digging it up, breaking it, and they don't know us, they don't know the country. They don't know what they're doing. It's been 52 years since the bomb and uh I don't know whether they're waiting for us all to die out and with the hope that it's not going to be too many they're going to have to pay. But they said, no, you know, you weren't exposed. But we were exposed all right. We were totally exposed. Australia is the only society we understand to have ever provided its own uranium to an overseas nuclear weapons state to make into weapons to then bomb back on our own land. I'd like to know the uh, after effects of this atomic bomb. Um, my three children have all had fine of the babies and I'm just wondering whether it came from that. My daughter's also got cancer. All of a sudden, you know, you march on Anzac Day, have you seen Tommy or whatever his name was? Yeah. Oh no, he passed away last year. 
Well, from cancer. And then you started to think to yourself, for God's sake, there's no one that no one here has dropped dead from a heart attack. They're all dying of cancer. You wouldn't mind if you had the occasional one or two that have died of old age or something, but they have all died of cancer. So, I mean, you've got to say to yourself, what's causing this? We were involved in a war. It might have been a cold war, but we were right in amongst it. To us, it's the most important aspect is to be recognised and to be accepted for the job that we actually did. We have asked only to come under the Veterans Entitlement Act. That's all we argue. We say no more uranium mining, no more testing, and we certainly don't want everybody else's waste products brought here. The government lied and lied and lied and lied about the blasted atomic test. We did as we were told, when we were told, and under the conditions that we were given. So we didn't betray our country. Sadly, our country betrayed us. Thank you.